let's start. Okay, so good evening and welcome to the first day of Pediatric Case Presentations uh, Pediatric Congress. Um, I'm Dr. Mariam Bakhtiari. I'm a third year pediatric resident here in Children's Medical Center. And I have the honor to be here with you guys to host this meeting and to present and to listen to our audiences and our lectures. So the panel that we're going to talk and we're going to join today is about ill child and in pediatric emergency care. And the duration of this panel is going to be around two hours and uh, before uh, going any further, I should mention a few notes. So this webinar is going to be broadcast live on our YouTube channel and you can access it after it finishes. Uh, due to the number of participants, make sure to mute your microphone uh, so that there wouldn't be any disturbances uh, during the lectures. If you have any questions, you can use the chat section below and we will ask them during the Q&A part of this webinar. Uh, if you want to receive the certificate of attendance for all of our webinars, make sure to register on our website and reserve a seat on your desired panels. For our Iranian audiences, if you want to receive CME credit as well, don't forget to participate in the panel quiz in maximum of two days in cmequiz.ir. Don't forget to follow our social media pages and YouTube channel and to stay updated on our next events. So. The Yes, so I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. First of all, we have uh, Dr. Shamil Sally, uh, Medical Director of Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, a senior lecturer and, uh, from Department of Pediatrics of the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Next, we have Professor Hadi Mohseni, Honorary Staff Physician, Pediatric Critical Care from the Hospital for Sick Children of Tor Toronto, and also Doctors Without Borders Pediatrician, and Professor Ali Reza Mwani, Associate Professor of Medicine, Senior Clinical Scientist from University of College of London. We are really honored to have you guys with us today. I'm really glad to see you everyone and I can't wait to listen to your lectures and enjoy this. So uh, Professor Gharib, if you have anything to add or not, we will continue. Thank you very much. Welcome to everyone. I am Dr. Behdad Karib, Pediatric Intensivist in Tehran Medical School. This is the 32nd Tehran Pediatric Congress and the first virtual one. When we started inviting the lecturers, we didn't expect this much of a generous response and acceptance. I should be very grateful to Dr. Mohseni Bod. Uh, most of all, uh, most of uh, our uh, Lecturers have been invited uh, by him. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohsenibot. And um, he, he also was here as our mentor for a short time. And uh, if I am allowed to say, uh, Dr. Mohsenibot really is a great friend and a true mentor. By having this, uh, by having and presence uh, of this group of scientists, we see the solidarity of those who are devoted to science and uh, humanity values beyond the artificial borders and uh, boundaries and uh, conflicts of our time, beyond the, beyond the, border, uh, beyond the limitations, boundaries and uh, religious conflicts and um, racial, political and these sort of differences. Thank you to all. And uh, we start with Dr. Mani. Yes. Okay. So Dr. Mani, we are all ears. So I think you're a co-host now. So you can start by sharing your slides. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Reza Mani. I'm very happy to be here to present some uh, information about oxygen saturation variability. I'm not sure if you sh do you see do you sh do you see my screen now? No, not Is yet. No. So I I I so. Uh, so I'm trying to share. The so. Okay. 
share screen. It gives yes. a message has disabled participant screen in sharing. Okay, so just okay. wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. So we will co-host you right now so that you can much. start Thank sharing. You. Sorry for the inconvenience. No Sorry. worries, no worries. Okay, so you're a co-host now? Excellent. Can perfect. See, yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Now, now yes, we can see. That's yes. wonderful. You're Excellent. Your, you're seeing your screen. Perfect. We're good really to good. Go. Ex excellent. Perfect. So it is my great pleasure to share with you some of our results and some of our research that we have done in the past few years. So uh, oxygen saturation, uh, SpO2, is one of the most common signals that most clinicians record at the emergency departments and at the intensive care unit. What has fascinated us in the recent years is the complexity of fluctuations that we observe in these signals. For instance, here in this slide, you observe that uh, basically, okay, so when we look at the cardiac rhythm, we see a very, very complicated and interesting fluctuations. When you look at body temperature, another physiological signal, uh, still, uh, again, you see very, very, very interesting fluctuations. And when we look at SpO2, also we see fascinating fluctuations. So when clinicians try to look at these signals, they often look at the absolute value in a given time, Sometimes we are interested to look at the means, but another way of looking at these signals is to look at their variability and fluctuations. Such variability measures are available for heart rate variability analysis. I know that even in the, in the pediatrics uh, discipline, for instance, heart rate variability has been used for assessment of early detection of sepsis, for instance, for assessment of autonomic dysfunction and so on and so forth. What we are interested in, in and especially in the past few, uh, years is analyzing the fluctuations that we observe in SpO2. And I have to say that since 2016, they are increasing, they are interesting, uh, in the, there are interest to analyze these SpO2 variations as well. I can mention one interesting paper published a couple of years ago. So if you consider the variability of the signal, it helps and it increases the positive predictive value of hospital admissions based on uh, vital sign. So there must be some information there, but we need to analyze it, analyze it formally and we need to find a, a way to analyze these things. So we can ask ourselves three types of questions, three important questions. First of all, if we look at the SpO2 variations and, and the fluctuations in a patient, for instance, in our emergency department, is there any useful information there? Or, or are we talking about just random fluctuations? We need to understand if there is any use, useful information here or not. Secondly, if there is information there, how can we quantify it? This is the second important question. The third important question is, imagine if we have a method to quantify these fluctuations, how can we interpret these fluctuations? What is the physiology behind it? And I have to say, answering these questions, it, it is very interdisciplinary. We need to have an interdisciplinary approach because these, these questions relate to more than one branch of knowledge. So a good clinician, I think, give a clinical insight, but then it is problem with, 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 uh, uh, with extracting information, how to extract information from these complex signals. We require uh, uh, help from physicists, mathematicians, engineers, and also physiologists to interpret these results. So, if we ask the same question from physicists, they have a different approach. So the approach, for example, that uh, Carlo Channon took uh, uh, about 70 years ago, just a few years after the Second World War, Carlo Channon had the similar question. What bothered him was how to quantify information when we have signals from telecommunication. For instance, he wanted to know if he wants to broadcast uh, from, to a television, how much for instance, information is embedded in the signals, or if you want to, for instance, talk about the uh, maximum capacity of channel to transfer information, how we can quantify these, these information. Uh, before that time, before 1948, it was very difficult to quantify information. And Claude Channel, he had a very interesting, innovative approach to measure uh, the measured amount of information. 
what he did was very interesting because he realized that actually, if you want to measure amount of information in a signal, you can measure average amount of surprise that you see in the signal. And this is a very, very interesting but simple explanation of information. So imagine in this, with just this example, imagine a grandma is, is wants to talk uh, to, uh, to, to her grandchildren. One of them just say, da, 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 da. So how much information is there? If there is information there, but it is, it is a limited amount of information compared with the, another grandson. Oh, hi, grandma, I'm playing Superman. So you have to see so much surprise. If I stop the sentence here, hi grandma, we cannot expect, we don't know what will happen next. If I uh, stop the sentence here, I'm playing, then what? If I'm playing Superman or another thing. I can, I might, the, the, the kid can play, for instance, basketball at this moment in time. So the um, average amount of surprise that we see in a message is a measure of uh, information. And that was a very interesting approach to quantify information. Hello, Shannon. He mentioned that actually, to, in order to quantify information, we can look at its irregularity, or he, he called it entropy, because it's very similar to entropy that is already uh, was already mentioned in in literature of physics, as physicists. So, the degree of irregularity in the signal or entropy might tell us something about information. This is actually then it makes many things easy. Can be applied to physiology. Can be applied and measure the entropy of physiological signals, for instance. It's, I think it seems uh, reasonable and, and feasible, but I think we have a problem. One problem here is if, of course, if you have a very regular signal, it can be SPO2 hearting, it can be anything. Of course, it has some information, but information is limited because it's a very regular signal. The entropy is very low. If we are looking, looking at a more complex, uh, net, uh, more complex signal, it is more irregular, it is more complex, and it has much, much more information. That is still fine. But when we reach a, 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 a time series, a signal which is random, then we don't have that much useful information because there is no correlation, there is no more memory. The randomness doesn't, have, doesn't give us anything. So if we want to quantify uh, information based on the entropy or irregularity of signal, here we have a problem. We need to distinguish randomness from something which is complex, but not random. And this is actually important and should apply something like this when we want to actually uh, uh, analyze and assess physiological uh, signals. So for analogy, I just uh, want to uh, just, just give this simple example. Imagine if the, you have a picture, this picture, it, it, has, it has so much information. It is a picture of a lady, it is Mona Lisa, and so on and so forth. But it is also made, it's a signal made of the dots that are just black dots and, and some white dots. We, have, we are talking about some pixels. And if I want to reduce the information of this picture with the same pixel, the same number of dark and white uh, dots, I can do it in two ways. One way is to make it very regular. Here we have a very, very regular signal, just white and dark. It doesn't have that information. It, is, it doesn't depict a lady. It is not about Mona Lisa. But at the same time, if I make it completely random, if when there is no correlation between these, uh, these white and, and, and dark dots, uh, still uh, there is no information as well. So if we want to uh, assess a signal, we need to know how much irregularity it, is, it has, but we need to distinguish from a random time series, which is not actually that easy. Just to translate what I said in, in, in the background of clinical medicine, okay, so imagine this is the cardiac rhythm of a healthy person. You see a lot of fluctuations and you see that this, this is a complex really time series. Uh, why it is it has so much fluctuation? Because we can see so much information processing here. It gives us some information about the effect of respiration on heart rate, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. It tells us something about, for instance, the bar reflex, the effect of I don't know, body temperature, a lot of things are embedded in these fluctuations. When we look at disease state, this healthy complex dynamics can be broken into something simpler with less information. For instance, in patients with, with atrial fibrillation, we see almost a random time series of when we look at the, the cardiac rhythm, it becomes more random. And then from this time series, we cannot really extract information from the respiratory rate or from something like respiratory sinus arrhythmia about by reflex, I think it is not as useful as this one. We have less, much less information here in the random time series. 
with in this case in atrial fibrillation. And if I look at the another way that these informations are they, they, they have less information and less complexity is when we have, for instance, the process of aging. In aging, we have reduced heart availability. In heart failure, in sepsis, in liver failure, uh, in all of these, these conditions, we have reduced heart availability, re reduced information processing, probably in the within the context of the physiological system. So one important thing, one important uh, question for us is how to distinguish between, uh, between uh, a, a random time series from a complex time series. This is actually important. How to distinguish these two? Okay, so what, I, would, I don't want to go through mathematics of it, and, uh, but, uh, but I think the mathematics is, is simple and, uh, and it is, I think it is, it is worth just talk about it for a few seconds. So basically, okay, imagine if I have this time series, this, is, this can be a physiological signal you record from intensive care unit. And what if I, re I reduce the resolution? I can reduce the resolution by averaging. For instance, if I, in, I average two by two those signals, I still I have the signal with lower resolution. I can do it again by averaging three, uh, every three, uh, for instance, data point. Again, I have the, those fluctuations. I can see the, still the pattern. This type of reducing the resolution is called multi-scale uh, method. So a scale one is the original data. A scale two is when we do averaging uh, uh, two by two, a scale three averaging three by three. three. If we have a complex, uh, point, uh, signal with a lot of information, we expect to see almost the same amount of complexity even after lowering the resolution. But if the, we had, if the, if the signal was random, because those random uh, the data points cancel out each other after more scales, after scaling and scaling, you will see the, the, these fluctuations and this complexity reduced and you see much, much less variability. So this method is called multi-scale entropy, and it's a very good method to uh, distinguish a complex time series, such as normal healthy uh, heart, heart variation, compared with, uh, with, with a random time series. And if I, I go back to the example of heart variations, for instance, okay, imagine here black dots are from a patient with atrial fibrillation, and the, the, just the circles, uh, open circles are from a healthy, uh, healthy person, the cardiac rhythm in a healthy person. In this case, you can see that if we do a scaling, a scaling is when we are lowering the resolution. And we, if we measure the degree of entropy or irregularity at the scale zero, the a patient with atrial fibrillation, it has much more entropy. It means that it seems more irregular. But when we do, when we lower the resolution and when we, 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 we do a scaling, we see that we, we see a reduction in the complexity of the time series in the in, in atrial fibrillation, while in healthy person it doesn't change that much, and it seems that it means that AF is a random data point, is a time series, but in healthy people we have a complex a data point which is not uh, random. Okay, apologies for such a long introduction. Let's go back to our original question. Now the question is, if we have sp 2 variation in individual in a healthy individual, for instance. It is, it is actually my own recording I, I took a few years ago. So do we have, is there any information there and or it is random or not? So uh, uh, this, this project was uh, uh, just uh, was uh, uh, done by one of my very good students, Amar Bogal, who is now finishing medical school. And he compared a, a group of healthy people, younger and middle-aged individual. And he showed that actually sp 2 variation is not random and it is affected by age. This is, to be more specific, this is one of, the, one of, uh, one of uh, his findings. So if I do again a scaling, I measure entropy of the signal at different scales. You don't, I don't see any reduction in entropy with the scale, so it is not random. And if you compare people who are younger than people who are older, you can see the entropy is reduced in older individuals. And I have to say the mean SpO2, mean oxygen saturation is the same in people older or younger than 35 years old. But just by looking at the pattern, you can distinguish who is younger or who is older. This is interesting, but what is the meaning? What is the interpretation of this finding? 
what, what, how can we interpret uh, entropy in of SpO2? And does it, does it help us, for instance, within the context of clinical medicine? This is something that I'm going to talk about it as well. So another finding of, uh, uh, that, uh, of Amar's finding was this. So if you look at health, completely healthy individuals with no challenge, with no physiological challenge, everyone is healthy. The mean, just mean SpO2, which we all measure in, uh, at the bedside or in the intensive care unit, and if you see correlation with the entropy or the irregularity of the signal, there is a very nice inverse relationship, which was surprising uh, at, the, at the beginning, but it, it is very consistent finding. So what does it mean? If SpO2 entropy shows the amount of information and information processing that we see, that we have, we have, which is embedded in the signal, does it mean that greater irregularity may indicate, indicate increased engagement of respiratory, respiratory control system. Probably people who have uh, SpO2 of about 94, 93 here, they're, 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 maybe their respiratory system must should be engaged more to, 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 to return it to normal. Is it possible that greater irregularity may indicate increased engagement of respiratory system? And if that's the case, SpO2 entropy can be used as a method for assessment of integrity of the cardiorespiratory system. This can be a good hypothesis to investigate. Okay, so because just looking at the healthy people, although was interesting, but what if we challenge healthy individual? What if you, for instance, uh, make some healthy individual, healthy volunteers hypoxic? Okay, so we collaborated with a group of scientists at the University of Portsmouth, and these scientists are experts in extreme environment. So they have a chamber for, normal, for induction of normobiotic hypoxia. I think it makes sense for the for people people who want to go for high altitude, for instance. This is these chambers are have their own uh, they are useful actually. Now imagine if you make some people hypoxic by decreasing the FiO2. The, if you, if the fraction of inspired oxygen is reduced from 21, which is normal, up to 12 percent, and you see these signals. This is the SpO2 signal of uh, at 12 percent. And you see that, okay, you expect the mean is decreasing because FiO2 is reduced, we have induced hypoxia, but also the irregularity of the signal is also increased as well. Here in this graph, you see the entropy of the SpO2 signal, and then here you see the, the FiO2. So with more hypoxia, more ent entropy is increased. So it goes along with what we found in healthy volunteers, but now they are challenged with a physiological stress. And again, if you look at the, in the correlation between mean SpO2 and sample entropy uh, and the entropy of the SpO2, again, you see an inverse correlation. More hypoxia, more entropy, probably more engagement of the control system. And I have to say that in healthy volunteers without any, uh, any challenge, we were here, but you see that that, that care is extended to, to cover more uh, reduced SpO2 as well. So this is also an interesting finding. And uh, uh, so it led us to hypothesize that actually probably SpO2 entropy give us something, could give us some more information than just mean. That might be something interesting. One easy way to do look at it is to see the correlation between breathlessness, between dyspnea, and, and these SpO2 indices. For instance, when you make uh, some volunteers hypoxic, at the FiO2 not of not, not 0.17%, then we have 17, apologies, been 17%, FiO2 of 17%. The mean SpO2 doesn't have correlation with degree of breathlessness. But this, the entropy of SpO2 has a correlation. That is interesting. So only the sample entropy of the, uh, of the entropy or degree of irregularity of SpO2 can predict the, the degree of breathlessness and even at, at lower FiO2s. So it means that, okay, probably the entropy gives us some much more, some, some additional information compared with just the mean measure or the absolute value that we measure at the bedside. Okay, but still this is a hypothesis. We need to find a way to test this hypothesis. The hypothesis is that SpO2 entropy, which can be easily measured by a very simple algorithm, may indicate the engagement of respiratory control system. And we can see that, we can see, think about some 
technical application for this. But this is a hypothesis. I just by analogy, I can say that the hypothesis is like that. Imagine in a political system, this is a parliament, for instance. Okay, so the member of parliaments, when there is no challenge, they don't need to actually have a lot of arguments. You don't see too much uh, controversy. So imagine if there is just something about something very, very simple and non-controversial. There is no challenge to the political system. You see, uh, not very much information processing. The same in normoxia. When everything is normoxia, we don't need to engage the control system that much. But imagine when we have a, a political problem, for instance, you know, ex there are so many examples for it. Then you expect the member of parliaments to, to just discuss, to have arguments, and to have much more information processing. So in a condition such as hypoxia, we expect to see much more information processing. And because information processing is measured by entropy, and to observe much more entropy as well. How can we test this hypothesis? Testing this hypothesis, okay, so we can look at patients, we can look at even healthy volunteers after challenging. Okay, so this, about a year ago, one of my students, a UG, who had just finished uh, the, the, the university, she uh, tried to answer this question by looking at different uh, signals that we record in, for instance, at hospital, for instance. Okay, this is SpO2 signal of a, a, just a patient, a hypoxic patient, for instance. Then this is the heart rate at the same time. It's, you can have a look at the minute ventilation, you can look at the tidal volume, respiratory frequency, and tidal uh, or PO2 and, uh, and, and CO2 as well. So if we have all of these time cells at the same time, if SpO2 fluctuation is representing the engagement of control system, you expect to see many, uh, you, you expect to see transfer of information from this. So if it is representing, if this fluctuation represent the engagement of the control system, you expect to see some transfer of information between these, these values. And if you ask physicists, they, they have developed a method called transfer entropy to measure how much information is shared between these signals. And what uh, Yuji did was to try to, to, to map the network of interaction. Okay, so these are clinical measures, heart rate, SpO2, uh, 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 then the minute ventilation, uh, respiratory frequency, and, and so on and so forth. So when we induce hypoxia in healthy volunteers, we, we, this is 70% FiO2, 14% FiO2, and 12% FiO2. So each link means that there is a tra significant transfer of information. By increasing degree of hypoxia, you see much more connectivity in this map. It means that you have much more transfer of information. As we expect, I think all uh, uh, clinicians, uh, all experienced uh, clinicians, they, 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 they expect to see something like this in people who survive, actually. So, uh, and, and you see that although we have these uh, transfer of information between these uh, physiological parameters that we can routinely measure, but the main hub of this network is SpO2. It means that whatever is happening, if we cannot measure uh, everything, by measuring SpO2 fluctuations, I probably, uh, we can probably measure how much processing we have got in the system. So, okay, so far the hypothesis is, okay, is uh, there is one step further from the hypothesis, but is it correct or not? So uh, if, if this model is correct, if SpO2 is really, uh, is, is telling us something about engagement of the control system, you expect to see that when a patient is challenged, for instance, after during exacerbation of asthma or during exacerbation of COPD or I don't know infection, so then you expect to see much more information processing because the patient wants to survive. Okay, we tested this by measuring SpO2 overnight for a cohort of patient in our hospital at Royal Free Hospital in London. So it's a collaboration with Professor Hertz and Ahmed. So what happened is. So we looked at those people when they were stable, they have a chronic lung disease. When they have a stable, we measure entropy at different scales. And then this is data a day before they came with the diagnosis of exacerbation of COPD. Okay, so probably due to infection or something else. You see that actually the entropy is increased during one day before exacerbation, one night before exacerbation. This is interesting. So. It, it, is, it, it goes along with our hypothesis, okay? 
And I just want to uh, just show you another two slides and I'll, I'll finish my presentation. Basically, this hypothesis is interesting. So when we have in, in people who survive, uh, in people who probably uh, they have a, 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 an efficient control system, we expect to increase their entropy and information processing when there is a challenge. But imagine when, when you are, if, if you're going to a system which has a, a failed political system, then you don't, you don't ex expect to see too much information processing when there is a challenge. What if we look at patients who cannot survive a challenge? What about their SpO2 entropy? This is uh, the result. This is what I want to show you in my last slide. Okay, here, this is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Ray and, uh, and Professor Peters at Great Ormond Street Hospital. So this is data of intensive care, pediatric intensive, pediatrics intensive care unit. Basically, we measure entropy of, of, of patients. Some of those patients survived and some of them unfortunately didn't survive. So this is the correlation between mean SpO2 and the entropy of the signal. Again, here you see the mean, the correlation between mean SpO2 and, and the entropy. In patients who survive, you can see a correlation. You can see the inverse correlation like what we observe in healthy individuals mm -hmm. exposed to hypoxia. But in people who didn't, in patients who didn't survive, you observe that there is not much correlation and also we don't have this, so we don't see this inverse relationship. It means that probably they cannot really increase the engagement of the control system. That is probably why they cannot really survive. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for giving me this this time to talk about and uh, just uh, just uh, summarize what I mentioned. Basically, SpO2 variability analysis has potential. Okay, we, we haven't done much clinical studies, uh, but I think hopefully in the future, probably this type of analysis, which is very easy to do, can be a part of uh, maybe uh, some trials to see if it has any 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 uh, any benefit in in, in 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 clinical care and in healthcare. I can uh, just uh, just briefly. Uh, speculate some of those clinical applications. For instance, for a &E admissions, okay, it is very easy to, to have an app connected to a smartphone to measure SpO2 entropy of patients when they come to the hospital. That might aid diagnosis uh, or admission, which patient needs to be admitted. Okay, in the intensive care unit, what about understanding, what about find for early detection of, uh, and, and what about finding a signature for catastrophic illness in the intensive care unit? What about prediction of asthma exacerbation, for instance? And uh, what about diagnosis of sleep apnea in children? There is a paper about, about it uh, recently published about SpO2 variability analysis and sleep apnea, which is interesting. And uh, there is one paper about A&E ad admission and SpO2 variability. Okay, I think I just want to thank uh, my colleagues at UCL and uh, at, at, at UCL partners, at our NHS partners, and also I would like to ask my uh, collaborators at University of Portsmouth, and also Dr. Karib, who invited me to give this talk. Uh, he's a source of inspiration. He has been a source of inspiration for me from many, many years ago, and I'm grateful for everyone who, who, who helped me to, to carry out research, and I want to thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and also the entropy um, definition and also the lecture on this, which was really interesting for me as a pediatric resident. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And you really enjoyed it. And also you are a source of inspiration alongside all of our professors, Professor Qarib and all of our distinguished guests so uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mohseni if you're here with us still. Could you please, can you hear me, Professor Mohseni? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. So hi again, Dr. Hello Mohseni. There. It's so great to see you again. I'm so honored to be here with, in your presence. And we're ready to listen to your lecture whenever you're uh, ready. So. Okay. Uh, I just now. have... Yes. I have to share my PowerPoint yes. presentation with you. Yes. Um, but uh, let me see, how can I do that? 
So there's a green button down there, share screen. Yeah. You can choose that. And after that. Yeah, then it asks me, um, one participant can share at a time, multiple participants, advanced sharing options. I, 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 okay, and huh. I don't know, how can I bring so, this PowerPoint presentation to the... So, uh, let us just check again that... Okay, let me see, because if I say on files, no, there's advanced, basic, open system. Okay, so can you, you, you have to uh, have it open. You have to have your PowerPoint presentation yes, open. It is, in it is open. Yes, so you don't see the share screen uh, button down there. Um, on my PowerPoint presentation? No, 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 no. in the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so in the Zoom, there is a share screen and I yes, click on okay. it. So. And then all sorts of files can yes, appear. Yes, yeah, there's a window and you, can, you should choose the PowerPoint window in there. Okay, just PowerPoint on, on now. So it says open system preferences. Hmm. Mm. Um, can I just drag it and bring it here? Or? I don't think that works like that. So what does it say? What's the error right now? Um, it doesn't. Hmm. So it, it, it just, when I put on the share screen, it goes to a, a screen that has all, you know, Microsoft PowerPoint on now, Microsoft PowerPoint on now. And then yes. there is a question, a, a, a exclamation mark on it. And I don't know how to, um, if I say files. No, you uh, shouldn't choose files. Actually, when you press the share screen button, a windows opens and all of your open windows will see, you can see them right there. And then you have to choose the PowerPoint in there. So mm, I, you've got to have your PowerPoint it. presentation opened before it that. Is, it is so open. It is open in another window, yes. Yeah, but when I open the share screen, I don't see that here. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe, um, Shamil, do you, if yours is showing up, do you want to do yours and then I'll yes, do after you? Yes, we can you? do that. We can go to Dr. Sally yeah. and after that, we can yeah. return to you. Yes, uh, excuse me, Dr. Bakhtiari, can, yes. can I explain? Yes, yes, please, Dr. Saif, so that we're more than honored. Okay, so we're seeing Dr. Sally's screen right now. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah he, he, you, you go ahead. Shamil and do yours. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can sort this out. Okay, so Dr. Sally, whenever you're ready, you're more than honored to listen to your lecture. Hi there. Um, can you see my slides so far? Yes, yes. Can Excellent. Yes, and we can hear you. Just if you can speak a little bit louder. Okay, I'll try and get a little bit closer to the I'll try and get a little bit closer to the screen. Is that better? Yeah, yeah it's perfect now. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm just going to go there. Uh, small that. I just want to get a mass. All right. So good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Shamil Sali and I work at the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa. That's an artist's sort of um, illustration of the, of the hospital. It's one of the largest uh, pediatric hospitals in, in South Africa. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Cape Town, this is sort of the beautiful side of, of South Africa. Um, Table Mountain on top is probably world famous, our football stadium that hosted the co-hosted one of the 2010 football games we've got a lion's head and we've got um, signal hill but you know as beautiful as our city is there's also a, a darker side to the city and i think all developing countries have darker sides to it where 
trauma, infectious diseases are, are more common. So I'm really going to focus or focus on severe traumatic brain injuries, which is a huge burden in, in our country and probably in, in developing countries. You know, so one of the main problems is that, as you can see in the photograph, you know, many children, you know, they don't have access to parks, so they end up playing in roads. You've got motor vehicles that drive too fast. You've got drivers that don't obey speed rules. So motor vehicle accidents, pedestrians being knocked down, is one of the huge causes of severe traumatic brain injuries that we see. Children falling out of trees, children falling from beds, and more recently, you know, I think violence and trauma, it, we're seeing a lot more pediatrics or children being caught in the crossfire of violent crimes. And in and amongst all of this, we also needs to, um, one, one needs to always bear in mind that uh, non-accidental injuries is real. And one needs to be mindful of, of non-accidental injuries as a differential diagnosis for, for severely injured kids. <coughs> So where do traumatic brain injuries happen? And they really happen all over. Probably a bigger uh, burden of disease in developing countries where infrastructure is, 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 isn't as secure as in developed countries. And the management principles really about managing children with severe traumatic brain injury is, I mean, ideally one should be preventing them but in a situation where they've happened already, you know, we can't do anything about the primary injury. And you, you have dead tissue or you've got an injury that's happened. And what we as physicians can do is we can try and save the penumbra or the injured tissue that, that is potentially still viable. And so the primary injury has happened. We try and prevent secondary injuries from happening to the brain. And secondary injuries that happen to the brain is from hypoxemia, um, children who aren't able to breathe, protect their own airways, children who have other injuries who become hypertensive, have reduced cerebral perfusion pressure, seizures, unrecognized seizures, unrecognized clinical seizures, and hypoglycemia. Um, and then you, what we do eventually is you convert a localized primary injury into a multifocal injury, and this can happen over time, over minutes, days, or even weeks. So starting really, uh, whenever you've got a child who's had a severe traumatic brain injury or any injury, is about resuscitation. And with pediatric resuscitation, it's about, in trauma specifically, it's making sure that you maintain cervical spine protection, paying particular attention to the child's airway and breathing, making sure that they've got a patent airway through which they can breathe and oxygenate. Spoken a little bit about circulation, but really paying attention to the child's neurology or disability. If the child's just been admitted, I think making sure that you're following the level of consciousness. Kids with severe traumatic brain injuries probably have a GCS less than eight and need urgent intervention to prevent secondary injuries. Warning neurological signs is, you know, severe decorticate or decerebrate posturing indicates severe cortical uh, brainstem abnormalities, unilateral dilated pupils are warning signs that you're dealing with a child with potentially a severe traumatic brain injury. So fortunately, children don't often have cervical spine injuries. Um, and when they do, it's usually the C1, 2 and 3. This one is probably a little bit lower down at about C6 or 7, and you can see a distraction type injury, soft tissue swelling anteriorly as well. But probably a little bit more subtle is, and, and seen on CT scans, is children who present with or are found to have retroclival hematomas on axial views of, of, of the base of the skull. So you can see. In this picture, I'm not sure whether my mask shows up when I touch it, sort of retroclival hematomas. And on this one as well, and in frame B, you can see an atlantoaxial dislocation injury. And then an MRI of the spine, you see a retroclival hematoma. So, you know, children also 
sometimes have, because the spinal, um, because the head is quite heavy, you have dislocation, relocation type injuries, and the bones can all be intact, but be, beware of a child with spinal cord injuries without radiological abnormalities. And what I really want to maybe just talk through is the latest guidelines from a group of experts who looked at the latest evidence for managing pediatric severe traumatic brain injuries um, and put together a treatment algorithm. And maybe to say that, and I think in pediatric trauma, a lot of what we do, the, the evidence is actually not very good. So a lot of the evidence is taken from adult studies and there are very little randomized control data in pediatrics um, for, for, for treatment interventions. I'm not gonna go through the slide as is because it's way too complicated, but maybe just to start at the top, you know, if you've got a child with a severe traumatic brain injury, you've imaged their brain, probably the first question to ask, is there a surgical intervention that's needed? Does, does one need to go and, and drain um, a hematoma? Um, or is the medical as the medical management going to take priority? But imaging the brain, defining the anatomy, and actually making sure that any surgical hematoma, any surgical lesion is dealt with. And at the same time, thinking what neuromonitoring you have available. You know, I think I'm lucky to work in a place with quite advanced neurocritical care. Uh, many places don't have access to intracranial pressure monitors. Um, going back to that hectic um, algorithm, the baseline care of any child with severe traumatic brain injury really, and this is what every child should be getting, is making sure that they've got adequate sedation and analgesia. The kids are thrashing around and fighting, the intracranial pressure would be increasing. Simple things like keeping the head in the neutral position, elevating the head of the bed will improve in a strainage, drop intracranial pressures. Thankfully, we've moved away from tight collars that compress uh, venous um, drainage and also potentially drain increased intracranial pressure. I think mechanical ventilation is, you know, is important. It's, it's utterly important in terms of preventing secondary brain injuries from hypoxia. Manipulating carbon dioxide levels to alter intracranial pressure by, by, by altering cerebral blood flows is, is vital and it's important to understand not cause damage and to be able to use that therapeutically. Most people aim for initially sort of a, a carbon dioxide PCO2 level of about four, four to 4.5 kilopascals. My brain works in kilopascals. I think that equates to about 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury. Hypothermia is bad for the injured brain. So initially you've got to keep children normothermic. Keep them cool, keep them not hypothermic, keep them normothermic. Make sure they've got enough intravascular volume to perfuse vital organs and the brain. Hemoglobin levels have been a subject of a lot of debate, but keeping it above seven in terms of adequacy of oxygen delivery. And then importantly, I think all children who are unconscious, who are sedated, could they be having subclinical seizures? Now the, the, input, the, the data about routine seizure prophylaxis is not very strong, but it is a concern. And uh, most people would use, um, once again, where in the world are you? We use phenobarbitone as a anti seizure prophylaxis, just starting to use levetiracetam, but many people will use phenytoin as surgical prophylaxis. I think early feeding is fairly standard in intensive care these days, but making sure to avoid hypoglycemia as a, as a risk for severe traumatic brain injuries. So that's the basics. This is where you start. And then you've got to be looking out for, for curveballs. What, what else could be going on? Um, I think a child with raised intracranial pressure, um, severe head injuries, you've always got to be on the lookout for, could they be herniating? You know, what's happening to their pupils? Do they have a Cushing's response? Are they hypertensive? Are they bradycardic? What's happening to their posture? And to be intervening early, to be imaging the brain, looking at the at, at a CT scan when possible, using hyperventilation judiciously and cautiously of short periods of time to reduce intracranial pressure. Um, Manitol hypertonic saline, the evidence between them is, isn't much difference, but most people in neurocritical care started using hypertonic saline to increase serum osmolalities and to reduce brain swelling. 
And probably the simplest thing is if you've got a, an EBD, an external ventricular drain, it's actually to drain CSF. Now just going down the, the middle bit of that algorithm, thinking about managing intracranial pressures and to, and to take you back to medical school, the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, where we're trying to relate intracranial pressure uh, and intracranial volumes. And you can see that initially, I mean, you've got your, you've got your brain, you've got CSF, you've got blood within your gray skull. And if you've had an injury and there's edema or blood, you just end up squeezing out CSF and you end up squeezing out blood. But eventually you need a critical point where you can't compensate anymore and your intracranial pressure starts going up quite dramatically. So there are multiple mechanisms for intracranial pressure. So when, if you've got intracranial pressure monitor in, you can't just have one treatment for all of these conditions. You've got to be thinking about what's the underlying problem and address the problem. Um, is, a, is the child that has intracranial pressure because they've got temporal edema? Is there, do you have too much intracranial blood flow? Is there subclinical seizures? Or have you impaired autoregulation? So thinking about the underlying cause and trying to elucidate that is vital. Spoke about intracranial pressure monitors, either directly into the brain or a ventri a external ventricular donor ventriculostomy is easy. Um, well, easy if you've got big ventricles, but often your brain is quite swollen and it's very difficult to actually get that into a natural ventricle. But therapeutically, if you have one in, and you're struggling with raising intracranial pressure, you can drain CSF as a, it's a quick way to reduce intracranial pressure. So one tends to target, you know, most people will target an ICP of less than 20, but one asks herself, where does this magical number of 20 come from? Uh, some of it is from data of LP of doing lumbar punctures on, on normal children, uh, but most of the literature targets uh, intracranial pressure of less than, than 20, or the evidence for 20 is, is not very robust. Spoke about draining CSF through EVDs and maintaining intracranial pressures, um, hypotonic saline boluses, some people even use infusions to target a serum sodium of about 145 to 150. And then if intracranial pressure remains high using additional sedation, analgesia, deep sedation, analgesia, and maybe even paralysis as part of your first tier approach to controlling array intracranial pressure. Um, looking at your cerebral perfusion pressure pathway, you know, looking at what your mean, and this is really deciding, uh, looking at your mean arterial pressure and your intracranial pressure, and it varies what, according to age, as to what cerebral perfusion pressure you'll be aiming for, but it's important to be looking and monitoring your intracranial pressure because if you've lost cerebral autoregulation and you're targeting a cerebral perfusion pressure, you might be driving up your intracranial pressure as your blood pressure increases. And I'll show you some graphs later. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're targeting, if you're wanting to increase your cerebral perfusion pressure, this is done with either fluid boluses using vasopressors like noradrenaline to, to target that mean arterial pressure, keeping an eye on your intracranial pressure, or even some hypotonic saline. Brain oxygenation is becoming more common as a, as a monitoring tool, um, and there is some data that, that relates it to outcome. So as a minimum value, people are saying a brain oxygenation, a brain tissue oxygenation of more than 10 millimeters is what you should be aiming for. But in order to increase your brain tissue oxygenation, you know, one needs to be careful about just turning up the FI2 because that could have longer term effects. Think about increasing uh, your vasopressors, no adrenaline to increasing your cerebral perfusion pressures, you know, carbon dioxide levels once again. You know, targeting if sometimes just um, by reducing your carbon dioxide level, you could be increasing cerebral blood flow. And then optimizing hemoglobin. If your brain oxygenation is down, then using a transfusion as, a, as therapeutic to, include, to increase oxygen delivery. So that's the first year. That's sort of your basic treatment. But if, what, what do you do when, when all of those treatments haven't worked to, to, to maintain or to control intracranial pressures 
and you're struggling with low brain oxygenation. And when you're stuck, when you're not sure what's happening physiologically, the next thing, the first thing to do is to probably look at the anatomy, get some brain imaging, whether that's a CT or it's an MRI, to exclude any, any surgically uh, metomas or any surgically remedial things. And then most people who would, who would consider sort of targeted hyperventilation, so aiming for slightly lower CO2s in order to, to drop intracranial pressures. Uh, probably the easiest thing to do is to increase serum, so, serum sodium levels as well, targeting sort of 145 to 150s, a hypotonic saline or some mannitol, where sort of hyperthermia hasn't been shown to, incre to, to improve outcomes, but if you're trying to control intracranial pressure that's, that's really quite labile, then a moderate hypothermia might be indicated. Um, and then barbiturate infusions, either thiopentone infusions or pentobarbital infusions is, have, have been used. Um, I know we're running, there's a bit of a shortage of, of thiopentone and pentobarbital at the moment. And pentobarbital is used in prisons to sort of um, send people on their, on their heavenly journeys, criminals, so it's quite tightly controlled. And then as surgical interventions, really, if your medical interventions haven't worked and, you're, and there's a good prognosis, and I guess what I'm saying is that a decompressive craniectomy is, is the ultimate um, treatment for trying to control intracranial pressures. But the indications for, for decompre decompressive craniectomy can be quite difficult because if you've got a child who's going to end up with severe neurological damage, it might not be the best thing to do or the right thing to do. And it's quite a, a difficult call. And this is where the new, we have to be guided by the neurosurgeons to choose children with potentially good outcomes uh, and to perform a decompressive craniectomy. And, and what, what is done, I'll show you that, that the decompressive craniectomy is actually just removing a big flap of bone, opening up some of the dura, and you'll see some of the brain bulging out to actually relieve brain swelling. This is just a very interesting picture um, to show you the dangers of hyperventilation and dropping CO2s and dropping intracranial um, flow, blood flow. Um, hyperventilation previously was a fairly standard therapy for, for treatment of raised intracranial pressure, but you can quickly, you can see the difference between this bright brain and this dark brain um, as, as, a, as a cerebral blood flow drops as CO2 diminishes. So these are some pretty graphs, you know, so it's great to have an algorithm, a treatment algorithm, but more and more with, we, we, we're moving towards a situation where you've got to target interventions. You've got to look at your patient, look at what's going on physiologically um, and, and give them the treatment um, that physiologically will make a difference to them. And more and more, um, I think neurocritical care is moving to sort of uh, quite invasive type monitoring where we're monitoring not just intracranial pressure, but cerebral blood flow, once monitoring brain tissue ox oxygenation, microdialysis. And, and I'll take you through some graphs where, where, we, we, where you're actually looking at arterial pressures, intracranial pressures, and, and brain tissue oxygenation, and how you had one treatment, um, how interrelated those, those parameters are. So when you've got intact autoregulation, you can see in the top blue curve, you're, you've got an increase in mean arterial pressure. And the top, the, if you're looking at the green one, as you're increasing your mean arterial pressure, you're increasing your cerebral perfusion pressure, you're then increasing your brain tissue oxygen levels. And you can see that your intracranial pressure drops very, very nicely. However, when you've lost autoregulation, what happens is that as you start driving up your your mean arterial pressure, you're getting an increase in cerebral blood flow, so that you're getting, so your green curve goes up, but you'll see that also your intracranial pressure starts going up. So careful, to be careful when you're targeting cerebral perfusion pressures, that you're not just blindly targeting a cerebral perfusion pressure of 50 to 60, but you're taking cognizance of the effects of, of, of your CPP on intracranial pressure looking at the effect of raised intracranial pressure. As your intracranial pressure starts spiking up, you can see very clearly 
that your brain tissue oxygenation takes um, drops significantly and you can see cerebral blood flow starts dropping off as your intracranial pressure goes up. Hyperventilation as a short-term strategy, you know, is a, is a good strategy of reducing intracranial pressure. So as intracranial pressure reduces, as you have less cerebral blood flow, as your intracranial pressure drops, you can see your brain tissue oxygenation responding to a reduction in intracranial pressure. Um, there's, there's a growing body of literature that's, that's associating sort of low brain tissue oxygenation with poor outcomes. It's a complex relationship, but more and more uh, once clinicians are, are realizing that intracranial pressure is one aspect of it, one needs to be looking at different um, levels as well. In terms of neurocritical care monitoring, we kind of mentioned this, you know, it depends on where you work in the world and what you have available. But if you're wanting to, to give your patient the best medical treatment, I think the more factors, the, the more parameters physiological monitoring you do, the more targeted your medical management can be. So really just some parting words is that traumatic brain injuries are common in children in developing countries. If you've got early, if you recognize them early and you do your basics right, you can actually improve the outcomes. Um, you can, we can't do anything about the primary injury, you know, as, as physicians. And I guess you need health policy makers and you need politicians and advocacy groups to try and advocate for, uh, for bylaws to try and, and improve public health. But monitoring the injured brain is, is important because it gives you a greater understanding of the pathological process that's going on in, in the child in front of you. It allows you to individualize and, and give your child the appropriate treatment. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Sadie, for your amazing uh, lecture. Actually, as a pediatric resident, the pediatric uh, traumatic brain injury is a, such a common complaint and also with a lot of uh, gray areas like uh, seizure prophylaxis or like prophylactic uh, hypertonic saline or uh, hyperventilation, PCO2 regulation. These were some major topics that I really enjoyed your lecture and thank you for that. So we will ask all the questions in the end, uh, in the end of this uh, session. So next, we're going to back to Professor Mohseni. Dr. Mohseni, can you hear me? Uh, yes, can you see my screen now? Because it says I am screen sharing. Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, okay. So... Um, we are more than eager to hear your lecture. Okay. Um, can you still see it? Um, yes. Okay. But I'm seeing a lot of slides, like... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, then I guess I, guess I went to the presenter window. Yes. yes, yes. So would you rather I just go back to the regular window? However you prefer. Okay, okay. So first of all, uh, thank you very much. I want to say hello to Dr. Harit and to my dear friends and colleagues there. Um, and um, thank you for inviting me there to share my experience with you. Also, uh, I would like to remember uh, my old professors there, who uh, a couple of them, Dr. Siadati and Dr. Uh, uh, Farhoudi are now deceased uh, when I was an intern there 34 years ago. Um, and uh, I would have much rather delivered this talk in Farsi, but I was told they should do it in English. So, so that's what I do. I'm not a professor, but thank you for promoting me. I'm, I'm still an honorary the staff at SickKids, uh, but uh, for the last few years, I work with MSF Canada and Canadian Red Cross. So, um, what I'm going to talk to, to you today in this half hour will be mainly sharing my clinical experience, some vignettes and some clinical tips on how to look after sick patients in resource limited countries. But uh, obviously, there's always need to be a zikr musibat, and I don't know what zikr musibat in English. So, um, there are some photos in this. Please uh, kindly do not distribute them or copy them because your patient's photos. I've asked them if I could use them for educational purposes. So, um, so why I'm giving this talk? Um, I think um, 
it's mainly to help you, to give you some tips uh, to identify problems that are peculiar to resource limited countries um, and how you can be better prepared to look after patients in those areas. Uh, what I want to uh, make a point of is that uh, working in resource limited countries is not anything exotic uh, or, or different what you do in your regular daily practice in resource rich countries or, or less resource limited countries. You would follow the same principles of scientific medicine, of professionalism and ethics, and of rigorous clinical reasoning based on history and physical examination. Um, and, and the last point is the most important one that I think improving the process of care saves more lives than any technology possibly could. Uh, so what would I call a, a resource limited setting? For me is that a place that there is no uh, healthcare system or a failing healthcare system, lots of corruption, no accountability, and plenty of diseases of poverty abound. But according to WHO, if uh, uh, per capita income is less than $1,000 a year, they call it a, a resource uh, limited settings. So this shows you in 2017, if all the countries had similar healthcare system. So about five and a half million children died in 2017. Global equity means that all countries were like Sweden or Iceland or Japan, which has a two per thousand in on the five mortality. 95% of the all children who died in 2017 would not have died if all countries were like Japan or, or, or Sweden or Denmark. Uh, but if we had regional equity, meaning that like in Africa, all countries were like South Africa, uh, then we had about 81% reduction in mortality. So it's still, uh, you know, a, a large reduction if, if there was some equity in, in healthcare. What I put at the bottom is the most important thing, ICU cannot fix health inequities. So what I'm to, going to tell you is not I'm, not, I'm not going to prescribe having an intensive care unit for, for, uh, uh, for uh, underdeveloped countries. So this slide shows just about what might work. There's nothing about ICU here. ICU would not contribute at all to reduction of under five mortality. If you buy shoes for people or give them cotrimoxazole or buy bed nets for them, probably you will save more lives. But, but I put just one graph here that shows that in Nicaragua between 1970 to, to 2010, as you can see, both the here, both the child mortality and the per capita income came down. So both of them dropped quite precipitously. Uh, and it's quite counterintuitive that why people are poorer, but they have less child mortality. It's because the girls' education went up through that area. So I think this is one of the most neglected things, that this is also from Nicaragua, that you can look at it. It's, it's a five-year period between 1988 and 1993. It's a Harvard study that showed that for poor girls who received education, the infant mortality rate came down from 130 to 20, so seven times reduction in five years if you educated poor girls. For rich girls, it wasn't very really different, but for poor girls, it was very, very important. So in summary, about, I mean, quite a lot of improvement in infant mortality, under five mortality in the last 20 years, but about 5 million children die every year. Most of these children die in some certain countries, I'll show you, but, Half of them die in neonatal period, and that has not changed over the last 20 years, meaning that 45 to 50 percent of mortality was in neonatal period about 20 years ago, and it still is the same. So that's where the least amount of reduction of under five mortality has happened. Of the rest, half of them die in the first year of life, and then the other half die in the other four years of life. So, so the, first year, the first month of life and the first year of life are, the, are where the most death happens. Next slide tells you what the diagnoses are. Why I put this here? Because WHO says after the neonatal period, respiratory infections are the biggest killer and the diarrhea, you know, dehydration. I want to tell you how these diagnoses are made. Most of these children don't, do not die at the hospitals. They die at home or before getting to the hospital. Uh, there's something called variable autopsy. People go there, their questionnaires, you know, was the child breathing fast? Yes, then they say had pneumonia. So a lot, of, a lot of these diagnoses that you see, you know, there's this much measles, this much malaria. If somebody comes and has a fever and they have a positive malaria test and they don't have anything else, they call it malaria. They might have had, you know, gram-negative bacteremia. They could have had, 
you know, significant sepsis with, uh, you know, a gram positive staphylococcus, but the, these diagnoses are made in that way. They're syndromic diagnoses, and a lot of them are based on verbal autopsies. According to WHO, if you breathe fast and you have recessions, you have pneumonia. When I was in Liberia, we worked at the children's hospital, we had x-ray, we had other things. 40% of children who breathed, who had a fast breathing rate and had recessions did not have pneumonia, they had metabolic acidosis. So just take it with a grain of salt. And HIV, you know, AIDS. When I went there, they used to do only HIV tests on children in malnutrition ward. We started to do it on every child who got admitted to ICU and we found out that 20% of people who were dying in the ICU, it was an HD really, were HIV positive. None of them were reported before that. You know, they would come and die of diarrhea. They would come and die of pneumonia. When what killed them, you know, was something else. You know, there's a famous uh, uh, Canadian surgeon and his name is Norman Bethune. He says there's two types of tuberculosis. There is rich man's tuberculosis and poor man's tuberculosis. The rich man tuberculosis doesn't kill him, poor man tuberculosis kills him. So, you know, if somebody dies of dehydration, they usually, you know, have had some uh, other, they, they were poor, they had severe acute malnutrition. So those things are not showing in here. Oh. Oh, I can't go to that. So this is still where children die, not very important, but as you can see, most children die in sub-Saharan Africa and in India, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, which is reducing. So that's where most of the children die. And most of them have comorbidities. So this is a very important um, slide, not, not because it doesn't, but it tells you that half of children die in the first 24 hours. Because in Africa it, or in Southeast Asia, it takes a long time to come to the hospital. And about the, for a third of children who die, this is the first and the last time that they had medical attention. So these, it's not that you know, they get sick and they show up and they die with pneumonia, diarrhea. There is, there is a journey of these children that unfortunately having a hospital may not be the solution to it. So this is very important to attention to. Now I want to, before I go into clinical cases, I want to have some examples of clinical scenarios. These three things, anemia, hypoxemia, and fluid, you know, status are very common in, in Africa when you look after children. And I want, the reason I bring this up because they are different from what you practice in, in your hospital or other places in the world. As you can see, this is for, you know, 6,451 adults and children with severe falciparum malaria. No, the mortality really didn't increase until hemoglobin got to five. So that's the reason we don't transfuse until hemoglobin gets to five. If they are unconscious or if they have heart failure or those kind of things, four. Uh, by heart failure, I mean hemodynamic instability. So by in these large number of patients, there was no increased mortality there. Again, it's hemoglobin of four. So if you're not in shock, you know, hemoglobin of four, there was no increase in mortality until you got there. This is the jail that was in front of our hospital. As you can see, the prisoners every morning came down and cleaned the street and then went back to the prison. So oxygen. Again, oxygen is very expensive in Africa. There's no piped oxygen. There is no, you know, it has to be either cylinder or it has to be con concentrated. This is in 36,000 patients in Kefevi, you know, research center that Kate Maitland have done. As you can see, the mortality really increased when the oxygen concentration went to eight, below 80%. So it, oxygen, it, you know, it doesn't mean that, again, I'm not going to tell you not to give oxygen to people, but the reason I'm putting this up is that to see how, you know, uh, a lot of what we do is on the base of uh, what is tradition and, and what is the practice that is accepted as written, but there's no evidence behind it. And there's a currently a study which uh, is on the way to show this. Again, this is in uh, uh, for mortality in feast the study that again showed that when the saturation dropped below about 80, uh, 5, 86% their mor mortality increase. Fluid bolts, you all have seen the FEAST study and you know giving too much fluid you know, is, is associated with increased mortality. So the reason I put these there is just to show you that in common clinical scenarios such as you know, hypoxemia or anemia, um, the practice in Africa or in places that the resources are limited does not necessarily need to follow what we're doing in research rich countries. So these are some general principles. Again, they might sound very, very, you know, experience based rather than or very consensus based or very personally oriented than what the evidence is. But this has been what my experience has been. Um, I think one has to 
keep it in mind that we have to abide by the same ethical professional principles as accepted internationally. We cannot go and do something in Africa because there is no medical council there because nobody you know will come and, and follow if you. So if you've not been trained to do something, you should not be doing that in a, the first place either. Always remember the first principle is the primum non nocere, that you're not going there to harm the patient. If you have not done something, use things like WhatsApp, telemedicine, telehealth, email to ask opinion of an expert or somebody who's done it before. And, and that would help you a lot. Be sensitive to the cultural norms. You know, when I went to some places after a while, they told me you're not allowed to say the word death because they were very scared of it. You can say, so I stopped saying the word death and, and they felt a lot better. Ask the local staff uh, and they would be help you. You're not there to fix things. Very old uh, surgeon, Dutch surgeon in Mal Malawi told me that things are the way they are because of reasons and they're not there to change those circumstances overnight. So again, there are some general patients characteristic that I'm going to tell you. Often the patients have more than one diagnosis. You know, we are, we are we're taught in medicine to put all symptoms and signs into one diagnosis, but in, in resource limited countries, children have multiple diagnoses. Often they have severe acute malnutrition. Often they might have HIV, they have TB, they have other opportunistic infections. Patients come to you very late, often moribund. Um, and, and, and you have to consider that when you, when you face a critically ill child. And, and usually 99% of the time they have been given broad spectrum antibiotics, they have been given traditional medications, uh, they have been given toxic doses of things, even things, simple things like iron, you know, they call it blood medicine or blood pill in a lot of places in Africa, and, and, uh, and acetaminophen. So uh, for every child that comes to you, a screen for, for severe acute malnutrition. And I use you to admit upper arm uh, conference it's easier and edema because 60 to 70% of children who die in the hospital have severe acute malnutrition, even if they present with HIV or TB or pneumonia or diarrhea. Um, and generally from all patients, people, children who die in Africa, about 45% of them have severe acute mal malnutrition as a contributory factor. And, and in these children, things like hypothermia or hypoglycemia or uh, electrode abnormalities are more common. Test every child who comes to hospital for HIV. If you cannot, if you don't have people to do it, do it for at least all sick children under two years of age. Never forget TB. TB, making diagnosis of TB in Africa is a clinical diagnosis. If you're coughing, if you've had a fever, if you've not responded to antibiotics, you've been ill for two weeks, you probably have TB. Uh, or if you have a positive exposure to somebody with TB, or if you're HIV positive, the height you know, goes up. Uh, a lot of children, especially in the malaria season, have a positive rapid diagnostic malaria test. That does not mean that disease is because of malaria. That's another problem in Africa, especially in the malaria season. Sometimes half of children who come to us will have a positive malaria test, so you should be wary of that. Um, one of the most common electoral abnormalities in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, at least in Malawi and, and Liberia, where I have experienced, is severe hypokalemia. And in almost 90% of the time, you have no lab to measure potassium, or if you have a lab, you can never trust the results. So any child who has a severe malnutrition, has had vomiting, diarrhea, and is very weak or don't have reflexes, think about severe hypokalemia. Um, so again, in your history, uh, uh, depending on the country, you know, a lot of these places are very maternalistic societies. You know, you always see mothers and grandmothers, aunties who bring the child. But in places like Liberia or Sierra Leone, most patients were brought to us were brought by a neighbor or by a relative, not the mother or not the father. Uh, you rarely see the fathers. Um, if you, if the mother is is not around, if the mother has abandoned the child, or if the mother has died, or has disappeared, or is not breastfeeding the child, it could be a sign of HIV AIDS, because HIV AIDS has a, still has a very bad stigma in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So don't forget to test the mother or the child if the mother is not around for HIV. Um, so I talked about intoxications. Um, most of the mortality in our hospital in Liberia where I was there was because of drug intoxication. Yes, they started with diarrhea, they started with pneumonia, but they gave him traditional medicine. They gave him adult dose of paracetamol. 
They gave him other drugs at very toxic doses, and that was what killed the child, liver failure, usually multi-organ failure is the picture that the child dies with. Um, if, if you see an, a child with edema in sub-Saharan Africa with a skin and hair changes, they most likely have malnutrition. They don't have nephrotic syndrome or cirrhosis or congestive heart failure because a skin and hair changes are very uh, specific for severe acute malnutrition. Again, adenopathy of the groin is very common in Africa. Most children walk bare feet, but if somebody has multiple adenopathy or bilateral axillary adenopathy or posterior neck or um, uh, lateral neck, or especially epitrochlear lymphadenopathy, think about HIV and test for HIV. So I'm not gonna talk about these things. Okay, what is a heroic treatment in Africa? So because Heroic treatment in, for example, Tehran might be, I don't know, putting a child on ECMO, if you can find ECMO. But, but heroic treatment, I think, generally is any treatment that puts a patient, exposes a patient to the risks of that treatment without clear benefit to that patient. So it might be a blood transfusion, might be a heroic treatment if you, if you are sure that 50% of your blood products are, are contaminated with HIV or HCV. So, you should be very careful about the treatment you're giving to the child. So what do I mean? Again, this is my personal experience with, with intensive care or critical care in the context of the uh, resource limited settings. Uh, it means do basic things really well. If you don't have a good triage system, it does not make sense to have a high dependency or intensive care. So you have to have that. You put all this, your sickest patients in one place and you put a good nurse to look after them because in some places there's one nurse for a hundred patients. So that's another important thing. If you can't do a, an early warning system on your wards, that would help a lot. Enable the nurses, give importance to the nurses. Um, and as I said, uh, it's very important that the treatment and it, or intervention should not be worse than your disease. And you don't want to have poor neurology as outcome. You know, that's worse than death in, in most sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is about the staffing. So you put the nurse and clinical officer. There are no doctors usually, the clinical officers that you put there. And you do bed rounds, uh, bedside rounds twice a day, and you keep track of what happens with the patient. Paper is a very expensive commodity. So I'll show you how to keep track of what you do every day. And this is the minimum equipment that you want in your ICU or HDU. And make sure nobody steals the curtains. This is on the side of our conference room. Do not steal the curtains. So this is what I used to do both in, in Malawi or, or in um, uh, Liberia that we have, we, they have bought a, a board for every bedside and we write the diagnosis, we write the weight, we write the problems, we write the plan for the day and we made sure that we updated every day and the nurses knew what it meant. So as you can see, you know, liver failure, secondary to paracetamol intoxication, could it be iron or herbs, you know, added to that, AKI. So most of our patients had multi-organ failure and they would have been very, very sick if they did a PEM score in any ICU. But that is, you know, you can see complicated malaria, tetralogy of follow, hypovolemia, gastroenteritis, deep ulcer in the left foot, bloody diarrhea. So patient, no, no single patient had one problem. They had lots of problems, but this is what we kept some sort of order in what we did. Again, this is a patient with DKA, you know, again, you can see that most of those are empty because we couldn't see any blood test or anything else, but, but, but we kept all the things that we ordered to the patient there and the nurses could look at it. So this is just one example of the ICU that I worked at in, in Liberia, in Monrovia. Uh, most ICUs, except a few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, you cannot invasively ventilate or invasively monitor patients. So ICU is a place that there are sick patients, that there is a nurse, that there is oxygen and that there is non-invasive ventilation. So that's what the ICU is. As you can see that 60% of our patients who died, died in the first 24 hours, which shows what the severity of illness was at mission. About 70, 80% of our patients who died had severe acute malnutrition. And the mortality is very different from those things that you see in WHO, you know, diarrhea, pneumonia. Almost half of our patients died with multi-organ failure probably because of intoxication with some drug that they were given before they come to the hospital. About 20, 25% of them were positive for HIV. And most of these children were younger than two years of age. A lot of them, that was the first knowledge of having HIV. Um, 
And electrolyte abnormalities, when we were able to test them, were very, very common. 20% of our patients had undetectable potassium level, meaning it was below the level of measurement of the, of the machine, which was one and a half millimole. It's a beautiful tree. So, so that was just as my zikram was too bad. Now we're going to the clinical cases that we had. So the reason I'm putting this kit is not because these are all the patients that you see or, or all the patients are like these or these are the most common things. I want to show you that you follow the same routine of critical thinking, of physical examination, of you know, using your resources as you would do anywhere else. There's nothing exotic about doing medicine there, but uh, the circumstances are different. So this is a kid, four-year-old HIV negative who had toxic epidemic necrolysis after his grandmother gave him cochiboxol. His parents were nowhere to be found. I think his mother had left him, abandoned him. So his grandmother was raising him. So this is him about a week after he came to us. He had extensive and severe oral, esophageal and eye involvement. And his eyelids were shot together. So they're not separable, you know, they're just shot together. And imagine the same picture that you see in front of the eyelid was behind the eyelid. And on the which was not visible. This is day six or seven of his illness. They had given him systemic uh, antibiotics, IV steroids, and pain control and oral morphine. He already had lost weight. He was not eating anything. I'm sure his esophagus was as bad as his oral cavity. So uh, he was, you know, this is like a severe band, but with the problem of uh, eyes and the problem of um, nutrition and fluids, pain control, and wound and skin care. So the reason I'm putting this in there because people are looking after this, this child, none of them were doctors, you know, they're all clinical officers. They had never, I mean, they had seen toxic epidemic closet in the context of HIV patients, hypersensitivity, or in the idiosyncratic reaction to cochimoxidol, they see it quite often. But this patient's problem, so you, you have to talk with your team and tell them these are our problems and how we can solve them locally. So, you know, this patient, if he presented to hospital for six children in Toronto, he will get an amniotic membrane transplant on his eye the first day because he will, or on the second day, because he will go blind. You know, the same stuff on the front of the eyelid and back of the eyelid causes adhesions and scarring of the cornea. So I had never done anything like that myself. What I did is I talked to somebody who's just one of the few people who are a sub-specialist in pediatric cornea in, in Canada. And he, he, he was in Toronto and I asked him, do you, do you think if I give this kid some drug and forcefully we separate his eyelids, which are now fused together and just cut all the adhesions with a little bit of a cotton ball and something, and then put some dexamethasone in his eye, would that be harmful? He said, I don't think it will work, but it probably would be not be harmful. That's all what you can do for this child. So, and I will tell you how we did it. We give him some ketamine. We you know, forcefully opened his eyelid, it bled a lot. And then we took a bit of a tongue blade and wrapped a bit of gauze around it, dipped it in dexamethasone and cut all the adhesions and then filled his eye with that cotton with the, with the gauze that was soaked in dexamethasone and three times a day dripped dexamethasone on it. Uh, for his pain control, he was an oral morphine. His wound care, we washed him with uh, dilute betadine and put the <laughs> flubazenil on him. Uh, and uh, his nutrition, he, there was no way that kid, kid was eating. So, and you have to ask yourself, what I'm going to do is the harm. You all you ask that yourself in your hospital, but in there, putting an NG tube and an esophagus that was as bad probably as his oral cavity has a risk of perforation. Do not kill a patient. You know, one of the reasons that they don't bring patients to hospital is that patients come to die at the hospitals in Africa. So do, we should not kill a patient with a procedure. It only, you know, I don't say do not do procedures that have risk, but, 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 but if you think risk of a procedure is high, more than the disease of the child, we should not be. So we gave a two cc syringe to the grandmother and every five minutes they were feeding the child with a solution called uh, milk called F100, which has a lot of calorie and, and produce three grams of protein and it has hundred calorie uh, per, per hundred cc. Uh, and so that was how we did this child. And this is him after two weeks and this is him after three weeks. And I don't have the other picture, but he was a lot better at discharge. Yes, obviously he has some, 
you know, you can see that this eyelid is everted. So some of the lashes would cause damage, but they're not on the central part of the cornea and it definitely needs a follow-up. But this kid would have been dead if you didn't do the nutrition if you did, and he would have lost his eyesight, which in Africa, if you're blind in two eyes is as bad as being dead a lot of late places. So uh, what I learned from this is that sometimes you have to do things you have never done before. But when you want to do that, always talk to somebody through telemedicine, through you know WhatsApp, through email, that at least is safe. And uh, always explain to the family they have fears and they don't understand. The grandmother was very worried each time you were doing this because his eyes would bleed a lot. So you have to make sure that they understand in this you know understandable and simple language. You need a translator. In Liberia, they spoke English, but they didn't understand my English. And, and make sure you, you arrange your follow-up. So that's another thing. You don't want to send the kid alive and in good conditions to, you know, to, to, to be lost to follow-up. So this is a very uh, big tree. Probably Shamil knows where it is. It's in South Africa, a very big baobab tree. So this is another patient, a uh, 14-month-old male with convulsions, abdominal yeah, distension. This is, sorry, decreased le level of consciousness. He's 14 months old. He was, I think, eight kilogram, nine kilogram when he came. His blood pressure was 140 over 90 and his BUN was 100. We were not able to do any other test that BUN and CBC were the only tests we were able to do. So this is his right kidney and left kidney. So this is the ureter, that's the kidney. He's a boy. So what does he have? He's in, he has hypertension, renal failure, so it's posterior urethral valve. And so what can you do for him? We had an anesthesia clinical assistant and a surgeon. Uh, anesthesia clinical assistant would not put this kid to sleep because God knows what his potassium was. He was not passing that much urine. Um, and uh, he was gonna die. So what we did is we gave him a lot, lot of local lignocaine and we gave him some ketamine and the surgeon did an extra peritoneal approach and got the bladder, brought it to the skin, made a fistula and we stitched this Foley catheter in there. And the kid obviously is now polyuric. So it was peeing 10 liters of a day. So we kept him in ICU and we tried to you know, keep him stable without knowing what his electrolytes are. Obviously this is not a solution, but the patient's life is at risk. So again, you have to think with your colleagues, get help, you know, if you need consultation with other people and do something which has the lowest harm to the patient, but you know, you can help the child. There's usually something you can do. And the reason I put those photos, you need to know how to use an ultrasound. You can see that I have used bets. I taught myself how to use bedside ultrasound. So this is very helpful for the child. Okay, and the blood pressure. This, I think blood pressure is the most neglected vital sign in, in children in Sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of times, the first time somebody knows a child is a renal failure when their blood pressure is high, or somebody with convulsion, you know, has a blood pressure of 200 over 150 is, you know, when the child has a lot of convulsions, somebody finally checks a blood pressure. So this kid, you, you should tell me to stop whenever my time is over, but five-year-old five -year boy with one or two day history of not being able to walk. Uh, it was previously healthy. His past history was not clear as the neighbor brought the child. In, in history, it can be very sketchy. You have to ask as many people as you can, but often physical examination is what you have to go with. So in exam, he was not talking. He appeared to doze off, but in between, it seems to be looking around. His tone was decreased. He couldn't sit without help. So no fever, no meningeal sign, no more vital sign, no Kaiser Fleischer ring, fund diver normal, optic nerve sheet diameter was normal. I will show you how to do that. And this is the kid. So you can see how he is. Um, just a few more seconds of this. So it's good because there was a talk about abnormal movements earlier to look at, see what he does now. Hey, so I won't show you the other slide. So
So what would you do now? <laughs> so a relatively acute two days, he doesn't have fever, he's a bit encephalopathic. So I just make a long story short, his abnormal movements are chorea, bilateral balismus, sometimes myoclonic movements. Uh, that going into his neck almost looked like he has a dystonic reaction, but I think he was just couldn't handle his secretions and that was got area obstruction. Um, he's not talking, he's somewhat encephalopathic in between. He looks a bit normal sometimes. Um, and uh, so if, if a child comes with chorea in Africa, the most common cause of chorea is Sydenham's chorea, you know, dramatic fever. But this kid is not Sydenham's chorea. Why? The children with Sydenham's chorea, for most part, are cognitively normal. They're not encephalopathic, and they have some control over their movements. This kid is very different. So uh, I'm not going to show you. Uh, this is another one. I'm not going to show you this. So what we did, so again, there's not a lot of lab work you can do. We did a, a lumbar puncture twice, and the lumbar puncture there, they cannot do protein or glucose. There's something called the PANDI test, which they add phenol to CSF. If there's a lot of protein, it precipitates. It's PANDI test was negative. It gram ne stain was negative, and Z Nelson stain was negative. There were a few lymphocytes. We could do a gene expert, which shows a, it's as good as culture for mycobacterium. It was negative. You do HIV test on everybody who comes to hospital and is sick, that was negative and his MRDT was negative. What do you do now? Because if this kid came to hospital for sick children in Toronto or even to Marcus Tebbi in Iran, you know, so this kid has all of these, you know, encephalopathy, chorea, bilateral bullismus, myoclonus, is afebrile and is acute. So it could be 100 different type of genetic diseases that gives this. It could be infectious, you know, HSV, enterovirus 71. It could be post-infectious, it could be autoimmune, you know, an MDA antibody. It could be antiphospholipid antibody. It could be connective tissue disease. It could be demyelinating disease. It could be Hashimoto or tire toxicosis. It could be intoxication, metabolic, post-hypoxic, serotonin syndrome, all of these things. And you have none of the tests. You don't have, you cannot even do a CT scan, which is useless, you need to have an MRI. So, uh, I will go to the same principles that we said before. Rule out lethal disease and rule out things that you can treat. If this kid has HIV, which HIV can do anything under the sky, or if this kid has TB, which again is unlikely, it was acute, you know, then those are treatable and they are, and if you don't treat them, the child will die. So you have to, you've got to rule them out as hard as you can, as completely as you can. Also, in any unexplained neurological presentation in Africa, think about intoxications, mainly traditional medicines, organophosphates, things like that. So we, were, we did what we could do. We looked at the CSF. We, to our best uh, capability, ruled out HIV and TB. And what we did, we said this kid probably has something like an NMDA or less likely something like a thyroid. Uh, you know, induced encephalopathy and abnormal movement. So we gave him five days of 10 milligram per day methylprednisolone, not, not methylprednisolone, we didn't have it. Uh, prednisolone divided in three doses. We gave him some uh, uh, stomach protection. And after that, we weaned him. And in four days, three days, he started to talk. He started to walk in five days. Obviously, when he was discharged, he never came back for follow-up. But I'm sure he had, you know, one of those either... So either an autoimmune encephalopathy with abnormal movements because of that or a post-infectious process. But the reason I put it there is that, you know, none of these diagnoses will show up in the, you know, in the data from WHO and the mortality in children in Sub-Saharan Africa because nobody makes these diagnoses. But, and usually you can help a patient. So now this patient, another patient, is a one-year-old child who came after three weeks of diarrhea his boy, presented in shock, and he was not moving at all, and he was not responding to painful stimuli by motor-wise, but he was awake and looking around. He had no deep tendon reflexes. He was given fluids to reverse his shock, and he was on broad-spectrum antibiotic, but he still continued to be very weak. So look at him. So he's not doing that much, but look at the position, posture of his face and of his hand. And this is probably... An, Look at his reflexes. He just wants to show he doesn't have reflexes, so no deep tendon reflexes at all. Again, look at him here. 
See, he's not doing anything, he's not crying, but he's looking. See, he's blinking and he's looking. So he's awake, but severely, severely weak and hypotonic. This is after his shock is reversed. So we can look at his hands again, and in French they call this uh, the obstetrician sign, or man de cut de shore. Um, it's carpal tunnel spasm. Okay. So after a few days, he is still symptomatic. We continue to have carpal tunnel spasms, and also he had very low potassium. That was the reason he didn't have reflexes. Uh, he was awake and alert, but irritable, not moving that much, no fever. And uh, we looked at his hand and, and feet. That's without, we didn't put a blood pressure cuff on his arm. That's called, if you remember, trousseau sign, you know, when you put a blood pressure. And this is as spontaneously, his hands and feet are like this all the time. This is another patient with severe hypokalemia. That was the way that I would test for anybody whose potassium was less than one and a half didn't have a reflex. So that was the way that I tested for that. And this is the patient after the potassium came above two. This is the same patient. This is another patient whose potassium has come up. So, so to make a long story short, when potassium is low and is not responding to potassium supplementation, think of hypomagnesemia. Again, you know, people never think about these things in those because they can never measure them. We could not measure potassium, we could not measure magnesium, we could not measure, but, but you can always think, you know, uh, what is possible, what is physiologically, you know, plausible, and how you can, you know, think that you can help the patient, especially if somebody has both hypocalcemia and severe resistant hypokalemia, the diagnosis most of the time is hypomagnesemia, and I'm not going to go through the pathophysiology of that. This is the chart, so what we did, we don't have, we didn't have oral magnesium. What's the problem with oral magnesium? Most magnesium salts give you diarrhea. The child already had diarrhea, you know. So we, we give, we run, magnesium is very common there, IV because of the eclampsia is very common in Africa. So we run a continuous infusion of magnesium. We also give him lots of potassium and calcium. And this is him after three or four days uh, playing with the syringe pump. So, uh, you know, similar condition like this, this is a triple opti. If you see it in your hospital is usually cisplatinum. Cisplatinum is what, you know, makes the kidneys get rid of kind of potassium and calcium in ways that is so the patient presents with tetany, with hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, which doesn't get better until you give magnesium to the child. So any child who comes with any of those things, always think about Electron abnormalities. In Africa, hypokalemia, I think, is the most severe electron abnormality. In places like Afghanistan, I saw hypernatremia very commonly, but I don't know what is the difference. I'm not going to, there's no time to look in. Some children with hypokalemia basically come like they're, they look dead because they're not breathing, they're very weak, they don't have reflexes. They still, uh, they still move their eyes, but they practically look dead, but their potassium is undetectable and they will die. And as you can see, because we cannot measure it and we cannot, so it never shows up. They say everybody comes and died with diarrhea, but not all diarrhea are the same. Okay, this is another child with sickle cell. Uh, so he came, uh, this is, I saw him on the third day. He's seven or eight years old, he's uh, five, sorry. His name was Osman. He presented the fever, headache, generalized pain, left eye swelling and clear eye discharge. And they admitted him as a, so, as a case of infection and sickle cell painful crisis. So look at his posture, look at his leg, look at that arm. They call this frog leg, don't they? But those two other, and then when you look at his other pictures, so that's his face, which, you know, initially people didn't look at him, but when you ask him to open his mouth or, you know, so you can see that he's got both seventh nerve and sixth nerve palsy, but there was something wrong because his, his hemiplegia is on the left side. So he has multiple discordance, you know, neurological findings in both sides of his brain. And this is when we did an ultrasound of him. Look at the mitral valve. Yay. So he's got the most horrible vegetation with that big tail on his mitral valve and his LV is dilated and not working. You can again look at that. He has got multiple vegetations, not just that one. So there's a large mitral valve vegetation with a long mobile tail. He's got multiple cranial palsies and he's got an LV which is dilated and dysfunctional. This kid, if he were in America or Canada, would have gone directly to the theater to take the vegetation off because 
this is not a kid that you can actually medically treat. But what we did, we, okay, we put him on uh, antibiotics. We had cloxacillin and gentamicin. We, because he has also a sickle cell, you know, uh, so we kept his hemoglobin around eight to nine, not higher than that. We did not put him on any aspirin because he had multiple infarct in his head. And I wasn't sure, you know, what his platelet is gonna be. Is he gonna have any bleed or anything at that time? And we fed him uh, because it was not safe. He, he was just drooling all the time with an NG tube. And this is him about one and a half months after. So, in, in, oh, we put him on once a day diuretic and once a day enalapril also. So a disease that was 100% would be lethal. You know, one, you have to make a diagnosis. This child was admitted there for three days as a sickle cell. You know, so you can see that, yes, he had sickle cell disease, but what was killing him is not sickle cell. This is another child, I will tell you this and then I will wrap it up because I can talk for until tomorrow. So this is a case I've never seen anywhere else. But, so this is a, a eight months old child who came in shock. I think he had diarrhea, dehydration, and he had multiple multi-organ failure. He had liver injury, jaundice, not being oliguric, severe metabolic aspects. We were able to do blood gases at that time. We had, a, uh, we had an ISTAT machine and he developed DKA. He had a DKA the way we diagnosed it. If somebody breathes as fast, has more than two or three plus ketone in the urine and his glucose is very high. So had all of those, he had developed DKA. And in ultrasound, I put this picture here for you to see that the pancreas is supposed to be looking like that. This is all his pancreas, so very swollen pancreas with some areas that might be bleeding inside it. And then he had an ischemic liver. So when you look at the, there is two or three probably in the whole literature report of children who had acute pancreatitis. In adults, there are reports of, you know, liver necrosis, acute pancreatitis with DKA, but they have, they have diabetes. But in children, there is acquired DKA in the context of pancreatitis with ischemia. And so, and, and what we did, we just put together, we, we treat the DKA there with, with subcutaneous insulin regular every four hours. That's the safest way. And we controlled the sugar, we gave fluid, and this is the kid after three or four days, four days, I think, it's playing. So a kid who would 100% be dead. So the reason I'm putting that there, because that is a very, very rare condition. You can, you know, with whatever you have there, with not that much of a lab, with critical thinking, and with, uh, um, you, you can reach the diagnosis. This is the way we measure intracranial pressure. This is an ophthalmoscope that has a solar cell. It can charge under the sun and you measure with ultrasound the optic nerve sheet. So I'm not gonna talk about this because I don't think I have time. Uh, if I just go back to the last slides and um, I, and this is typhoid, I'm not going to. Just I'll show you one more case and then we'll go finish it. A, a kid who had HIV, eight year old girl with HIV, once month, one month of cough, chest pain, generalized body pains, was not eating anything, weighed 12 kilogram, eight year old, looked miserable and she wanted to go home and die. That was what she said, she wanted to go home and die. She was on tenofovir, efavirenz, and abavacare, abavacavir for, for HIV. Her mother obviously had HIV. Both of them were in the same regimen. Uh, and their chest x I'll show you. So any kid who comes with HIV and has fever and cough, hasn't got better on broad spectrum antibiotic after 10 days, has TB. That's the way that we say somebody has TB. So she was a started anti-TB treatment, but after seven days, still had high fever, not eating, has lost more weight. And... Uh, looked that she was dying. So on repeat exam, she had a two or three over six systolic ejection murmur the lower left center border. But the clinician there had attributed that to anemia because she had a hemoglobin of six. This is her X-ray. So the lungs are not that bad. There is definitely not that much of a lymphadenopathy. The heart looks a little bit big. So Osler says, listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis or she's telling you the diagnosis. That's the translation of it in Farsi. Dr. Mir Majlisi used to tell us that whenever we were not seeing the. So again, accept the quality of the. So this kid had right-sided infective endocarditis. You know, I was there only for five months. So I saw three infective endocarditis. And again, this is, you know, lots of vegetation on the tricuspid valve. So we treated her for endocarditis. 
um, at the same time, this came out at the same week in New England Journal of Medicine that you don't need keeping a kit on six weeks IV antibiotics in Sub-Saharan Africa is a disaster. So you can change it to oral after 10 days and this is she before discharge. So um, if a child with suspected TB, pulmonary TB is still febrile and ill, who continues to deteriorate after seven to 10 days, doubt the diagnosis or you have resistant TB, but that would be very unlikely here. It is unusual for a child to have pulmonary TB without lymphadenopathy. Pulmonary TB is a lymphadenopathy disease. So if you have no lymphadenopathy, again, you know, HIV kits can be different, but um, examine a febrile or sick child every day as if it's the first time, because then if the mama was not picked up the first day, somebody would pick it up the second day. And the last thing is that often the literature from resource rich countries is proving helpful in managing patients in poor countries. That article was from Denmark, you know, 400 adult patients, but it helped us, you know, sending a kid home in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is another interesting kid. He's a one-year-old kid who had a fever, had a so-called measles and was still febrile after 12 days. And the parents left the hospital and came to us because they were not happy. They said the IV went bad and went. So this is a one-year-old kid. The mother wants to pick the child. Look at the kid, not using the arm. A child younger than four, three, four years of age should not have arm preference. So he's not using the arm, okay? Um, again, you can see not using the arm. So I asked the father to show me the pictures of her measles. This is the her measles. Measles never does this. Measles never, uh, the scaling doesn't get your fingers like that and it doesn't peel like it's called molting. Um, and fever of measles should go away, you know, except if there's a complication such as pneumonia or encephalitis. So this is a Kawasaki disease. And it only treated for Kawasaki. So uh, let me then finish um, finish my presentation because we can go and continue forever. Um, these are all bad pictures. That, another Kawasaki, and lots of liver tumors. So, is almost always something you can do to help a sick child. Even if you work in places that there are no labs, there's nothing else. Your treatment should never be worse than your disease. Learn to use a bedside ultrasound and ask for help, telemedicine or email or WhatsApp, those are all available. If you have money and time to spare, do the Liverpool or London tropical medicine course. And if you don't, that's you know fine. This was a prayer from Robert Hutchison has a very famous book in in physical examination, it says, from putting knowledge before wisdom, science before art, from treating patients and cases, and from making the cure of disease more grievous than the endurance of the same, good Lord, deliver us. So that was the end of it. Bailey, I wanted, my main point was to show you that medicine is the same. You have to use critical thinking, physical examination, consulting with others, and uh, it's not that everybody in Africa dies of diarrhea and, and pneumonia uh, and doubt the diagnosis that you hear. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohseni, for this. I'm not a professor. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Mohseni, for this great lecture, yeah. for this inspiring talk and to think about this, to to have this another view of these uh, situations that were and the patients that were saying it was really inspiring and motivating and moving and thank you so much for sharing these ama amazing slides and the pictures and the patients and the cases and everything and uh, we really enjoyed it so uh, someone asked in the chat section about the what happened to the patient with the mitral valve problem do you know what happened so i don't they sent me a picture of him after six months. He's walking, all of his cranial nerves are normal uh, and he's completely well. Had very a slight weakness of that left side, but the cranial nerves were completely fine. Okay, I mean, so obviously they were not able to do ultrasound and echo when I left, but hopefully, you know, because I think it's very good that everybody teaches themselves how to do the ultrasound and, and, and go visit the radiology department to learn how to do. So there is a machine called M-Turbo, which I did all of these with it. 
and I had only one probe, so it's not I ideal. But we did we do the intra orbital we do the orbital ultrasound with the linear transducer. We do the liver, kidney with an abdominal, you know, transducer, and the heart with a spectral one. But if you have only one probe, then you do whatever you can do. Wow, that's interesting. So thank you so much again for sharing your time, sharing your experience, your expertise, and we really enjoyed this lecture. And I don't know if you see in the chat section, you and also all of our other professors who've accepted our invitation, you're all more than welcome to join us in Iran. We can't wait to see you all in here and in different cities. I'm seeing an invitation to Mashhad. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you can see all of us here tonight. And we are more than honored to meet you and to be here with you. And can't wait to meet you again in the next session. Thank you very much. Any so, questions that I, is, but I need to answer or no is a uh, is a uh, uh, shamil is still there dr sally ah uh, yes how are you oh sorry shamil you know in i just had one question for you in resource limited countries you know which you cannot measure intracranial pressure you can do the ultrasound but that's just one off picture it's not continuous and you cannot invasively monitor the blood pressure and those kind of things and patients come to you very late you know and, and all those do you think is there any place to do again you do not want to produce neurologically poor you know patients who are only alive you know rather than than being able to have a life uh, but is there a place to do the craniectomy sooner in places that there are, there's no ICU really, uh, first thing, and second, or you think that is not, you know, that's just going to be fraught with complications and things like that. And then, and the second thing that I, I wanted to ask you was that, um, you know, things like transcranial Doppler, people using sickle cell and things like that, but in head trauma, has it ever opened, had a place to monitor, you know, the blood flow to the brain? And think in places that you cannot do a juggler bulb or do you know uh, do metabolic testing of the brain or measure ICP or things like that. Heidi, um, so to answer your first question, I think if you're in a situation where you need to do a decompressive craniectomy as a last resort, that's probably a bad thing to do. I know, I know, not not to do it as a last resort. That's what I meant. Do it, but, you know, in a child that you think you know, has because a lot of places that the way they diagnose things, you know, they diagnose, you know, they, they don't do bear hole. Some, I mean, they can do a bear hole and see if there's blood under it or not, but, but do it, so, do it sooner than, you know, waiting until, because I think that's pointless to do it when a child, you know, has a GCS of, you know, five and things like that. So sure. I, Are you aware of any studies done in those kinds of conditions? So we've only done them as last resorts, uh -huh. you know, when, when there's been no response to medical yeah, treatment. Yeah, yeah that's um, the way that I am familiar with. <laughs> so I don't think there's a study really about them doing them uh -huh. early, but the problem is in pediatrics, and I think in brain, in brain trauma in a lot of pediatrics, that we just don't have yeah, yeah. good data. Everything is extrapolated uh -huh. from, from yeah, pediatrics, yeah. from adults yeah. to pediatrics. Yeah. Yeah, and do you do you still keep because I know hyperterm fever is bad. So always but, but, bad. Yeah, yes. but do you do you do you actively cool them still? Because yes, you can bring the ICP down with cooling, but it doesn't change the outcome very much. You know, it's yes. similar. So do, do you don't do that anymore? Do you like actively cooling them if the ICP doesn't come down despite, or you go to a craniectomy? So we would cool down to about thirty four. Uh, influence I might not change outcome uh, but it's a measure of control of intracranial yeah. yeah 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 you can always do that you need controls <laughs> <laughs> and you <laughs> you hope that the outcome is going to be good yeah yeah, yeah. and I had one question for um, for our different uh, Dr. Mani you know because I'm not at sick kids anymore but the latter years there we brought this 3T system which is looks at the big data and gets, you know, it looks at variability of, and, and we generally, you know, to make it simple, variability is good, you know, if heart rate or, uh, so in your oxygen saturation, have you had any pattern like that, that if you don't see variable or the variability index goes down, is this poor sign of, you know, 
have you had that kind of a correlation or not? Because if we see somebody even in clinical exam whose heart rate stays at 120, doesn't go up and down that much, it's usually a bad sign, you know, get that poor cardiac function or, or there's some neurological problem or something like that. Interesting question. I guess variability is good in physiological system, but the, the main question is how to measure it. Uh, and so basically the, the, the simplest method is using the some deviation of those at uh, those numbers which has been used a lot but then it doesn't really show us the complexity and the second way is using the old-fashioned spectral analysis like what is done for the EEG or even for the ECG to look at different I guess different bands with different frequency okay and also the, the entropy that I mentioned is top is the, 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 the beauty of it is it measures the amount of information processing and I've, I've actually, it is not difficult to measure because maybe probably by our eyes, a clinician might not see the, the entropy, but there are very, very simple algorithms that can be added uh -huh. to, I don't know, ICU monitors or can be added to even the, the small phones. And yeah. Yeah, it's very easy to measure it. Uh -huh. Within the context of heart rate variation, I totally agree with you. It's that you can define something like a variability index. Mm -hmm. I know that, for instance, for the for the uh, in neonatal in the NICUs, there is a system called Hero, which I don't know if it has been very. I think in the US, some people use it, and it, it is measuring the variability index for prediction of sepsis in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in the neonates. But the problem with SpO2 is that in healthy people without any challenge, you don't see much variability. Mm -hmm. SpO2 is always 99, yes, yes. 98, yes, you don't yes, see yes. it. But you see more because probably it is the, how the physiological system is designed. Mm -hmm. But when we, we look at the, we want to look at the SpO2 variability, we need to look at it at the same time, depends on the challenge. So we need to see a correlation between the mean of the, 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 the SpO2, for instance, and how much variability is. So it is like if you want to assess a kid, uh, uh, for instance, just 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 the weight is not enough. You need to see, uh, you need to actually look at height and weight at the same time. So it has two dimensions, and I have to say that it is a little bit in its infancy. We have to yeah, yeah. we have to do much more studies to see yeah. if actually it can be used as a measure for maybe low income countries, but in poor resource, SpO two measurement is easy. I think a very, very simple algorithm to uh, most of the those sensors is very easy as well. Hopefully, future data shows that it can be used for assessment of how the critical the patient is depends on the challenge. Thank you. Thank you for a good, very good question. Okay, so thank you so much again. Thank you everyone, uh, Dr. Mani, Dr. Sali, and Dr. Mohseni for joining us tonight. Actually, we don't have time to ask the questions that are asked in the chat section but we would really we will look forward to meeting you in our next sessions in our next panels and also hopefully in COVID free days here in Iran and even us there so <laughs> can't wait to meet you and thank you and have a great day Thanks, Bye. do I need to answer those then on the chat or, or if we close it they will go away if we close um, this if we close this, they will go away. But... Okay. Okay. If it's very vital for them, they can ask me through you. So you send me an email. I yes. Know. Okay. Yes. Okay. We will contact you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank That's you so okay. much. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much. Bye bye. Have a great day, bye -bye. everyone. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.